For over 100 years, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has been serving Iowans. As our state recovers from COVID-19, we will continue to deliver information and education based on research to help you care for your family, manage stress, and support your community, your business, and your farm. We're here for you now, and we will be for the next 100 years. Together, we will build a strong Iowa. All right, hi there everyone. Uh, welcome back to another session of the Sioux Lane Garden Show. My name is Caitlin Brinkeroff. I'm with Iowa State University Extension Outreach in Woodbury County. And I also have Carol Larvik with me with Nebraska Extension in Dakota County. So really quick to get started, we're gonna have our welcome PowerPoint. So just a reminder for everyone to go ahead and join us in the comments. So go ahead and find uh, the comments section if you guys are watching on Facebook Live or if you're watching on our website, you can open the tab into YouTube if you have a YouTube account and you can comment there as well. Uh, we'd love to know where you are joining us from and also if you're a master gardener or if you're just a garden lover. Um, and then this is also the spot where you can ask questions throughout the presentation and then we'll have time for Ed to answer those at the end as well. So just a reminder uh, that we have only three more sessions of the Sealand Garden Show left. So later this afternoon, we're going to be talking a little bit about wildlife and the landscape. And then next week, um, we're going to talk nature's best hope and using annuals and perennials in the landscape design. Uh, so make sure to join us um, later this afternoon and next week for some more presentations. Um, for descriptions and to learn a little bit more about those presentations, you can go to the Siouxland Garden Show website page and you can find out a little bit more there. Of course, I got to say a big thank you to the Siouxland Garden Show Committee for helping us put together um, this awesome virtual show as well as our in-person shows. Um, so back in September, we had to make that tough decision of staying virtual for 2021. Um, but we've always been planning our in-person shows and so we're happy that we're still uh, able to provide some kind of education to our community. Um, so it is a collaborative effort between Iowa State University Extension Outreach of Woodbury County, as well as Nebraska Extension in Dakota County. Um, and we have Carrie King, Carol Larvik, Molly Hewitt, myself, Caitlin Brinkroff, Kevin Potabom, Emily Yaki, and then the bottom three are master gardeners. We have Rex Towns, Randy Burnight, and Diana Kincaid. Um, so it's been a great group to work with all these years, and we're actually celebrating, I think this is our I forget every session. I think this is our 15th uh, garden show. Uh, so next year we're going to be celebrating our 16th, which we want to make sure that you guys mark the calendar for. So make sure to save the date for our 2022 show. We are planning on being back in person um, and it's going to be April 2nd and April 3rd. Uh, so a Friday and Saturday, and we're going to be at the Marriott Hotel Center in South Sioux City, Nebraska. So if you joined us back in 2019, we'll be back in the same area. Um, all kinds of fun stuff. We'll still have um, an awesome educational sessions. We have a winter's farmer's market, local garden vendors, uh, master gardeners there uh, that you can ask questions to, all kinds of fun stuff. It's only $5 each day to get in. Um, so we hope that you guys can join us. Um, and just a reminder that all of our virtual sessions are free. And of course, another big thank you to all of our volunteers and vendors. Um, the in-person shows wouldn't be possible without you and all the support. Um, we have over 70 Master Gardener volunteers that actually help us put on our in-person shows. Um, so we're happy that we're still able to provide all this great education for you guys um, and looking forward to seeing you back in person. And same with our vendors, always providing great um, education to the community and all kinds of goodies for folks that want to come out to the garden show. So we're looking forward to 2022 and being back in person. And another thank you to all of our great sponsors that help us put on uh, the garden show. So if you want to check out the top left corners where you'll find out um, the sponsors during each session, if you want to learn a little bit more about each sponsor, feel free to visit our website and you can actually click on their logo and you can learn a little bit more about them. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get Ed on the screen here. So Ed, we have you on screen and we have your PowerPoint up ready to go. So Carol and I will go ahead and jump off and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for having me here to talk about monarchs. Um, 
Monarchs are a great butterfly and actually a great animal to promote conservation, whether it's at home, on the farm, in the cities, uh, anywhere you can think of, uh, because everybody loves butterflies, uh, but not necessarily everybody understands what's happening with these butterflies and what we need to do to help them. And by helping them, we also help a whole slew of other species, of other pollinators. So today I'm gonna to talk a, a little bit about uh, monarch biology, because they're a little bit different than other uh, butterflies in a couple regards, and then talk about how do we create habitat to help them. And that's really the big thing. How do we help them after we unfortunately talk a little bit about, you know, why they're in trouble. So first off, monarchs are pretty easy to identify. They're really that big orange and black butterfly that you see. And actually, the interesting thing is they're actually real easy to tell the difference between males and females, even when you see them on the wing. So you can get an, <clears throat> excuse me, get an idea if you have mostly males coming to your garden or when you do see females, that could be a good indication that there might be some egg laying. So when you look at the two, the biggest characteristic you see with the male on the right are the two little black dots on the hind wings. Those are areas uh, that uh, hold what are called pencils. They actually release a scent to attract females. Uh, they also are usually much more orange than the females are. The females tend to be a little more drab. But as the butterfly ages, they can be a little drab overall. The only butterfly you can really sometimes mix them up with is the viceroy. And you can see how very much it looks like a monarch butterfly. But the one thing that really sets it apart from the monarchs, when you look at the hind wings, there is a stripe that goes right through the hind wings. <clears throat> right here, it kind of looks like a, a big smile. That is a characteristic of the viceroys. They're also a little bit smaller than the monarchs, but if you see this, you know right away. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't tend to notice this, so oftentimes you'll see articles and papers and magazines, even book covers that talk about monarchs, and they unfortunately put in a viceroy. Now, monarch butterflies, like a lot of insects, go through what's called complete metamorphosis. They go from an egg to a caterpillar, to a chrysalis or pupa, to the full-blown adult. So each of those stages requires a little bit uh, different thinking in how to help those butterflies. So we'll talk a little bit about each one. And that's the thing about complete metamorphosis. By having the young feeding differently than the adults, they don't compete for resources. But what it means to the gardener um, or the farm or anyone else is that you have to have two different resources to help both the young and the adults. So let's start with the, the very young. This is the egg. And the eggs are often laid on the underside of leaves. And the only thing that monarch caterpillars, we'll talk about this again, the only thing that monarch caterpillars can eat is milkweed. There are a lot of different species of milkweed out there, but it's the only thing they can eat. So that is where the females are gonna lay their eggs only on milkweed. They don't also lay them in large clusters. They just lay them very singly um, in discrete little places. If you look very closely, and you can sort of see it in this image, there are little ridges along the, uh, the egg itself, which is a telltale indication that's a monarch egg. Occasionally, they may lay them in a young flower cluster. Here, right on the left-hand side, is a monarch egg. <clears throat> this gives you an idea <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a bike accident recently and I'm taking some meds, so it's going to dry out my mouth. Sorry about that. So this gives you an idea of how small those eggs are. Uh, this is compared to actually my wife's hand, uh, whose hand is a little bit small anyway, but this gives you an idea of how small these eggs are. But you can see that this is the only thing you're noticing on the underside of those leaves. When the egg hatches, Probably the first indication will be a little bit of herbivory, a little bit of chewing on the leaves around it, and a little bit of these little black dots. That's frass or caterpillar poop. So if you see that, odds are you've got a caterpillar around or there was a caterpillar around, but look very deep inside some of those leaves initially because they are very small. And so they might be hidden away in the plant. During their life, they get bigger and bigger. So here's a good indication showing what are called the first instar. And the instars are the different stages. So there's five different stages for the caterpillar before it becomes a pupa and then the adult. And when you look at the very first instar compared to the fifth, 
Uh, the fifth may be about three and a half, even up to sometimes four inches long. There's a lot of eating going on in just a short life of a caterpillar, a lot of growing. And for each of those stages, it sheds its skin in order to be able to grow into its new skin. Now, what sets monarchs apart from other butterflies, we also go through this metamorphosis, is the migration. Monarchs are known for their migration, going from their overwintering sites way down in Mexico, in the Oyamel fir forests, uh, not too far outside of Mexico City, and then moving up all the way even into southern Canada. And of course, in the central U.S., Missouri, where I am, or Iowa and Nebraska, this is a major area for reproduction for monarchs. So even though monarchs coming from Mexico go throughout this area, the brunt of the population, the breeding population, <clears throat> is really in that central Midwest area. And numbers actually I've seen vary from in this particular uh, illustration and from this research, about 38% of the entire monarch population that heads to Mexico is coming from what we call the Midwest, from Ohio through Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, southern Minnesota. Some estimates actually go even high as 50% of the entire overwintering population comes from this area, which we now tend to call the corn and soybean belt because we've re replaced that monarch habitat now mostly with corn and soybeans. Monarchs are also different too in that they are multi-generational, meaning that you have a lot of different generations throughout the year. Now, most butterflies, if you go out into your garden at some time of the year and you see something like a tiger swallowtail, for example, you may see the adult tiger swallowtail. If you've got the right host plant, like a tulip poplar, you may see the caterpillar. But you tend to only see it during a certain time of the year when the adults are present. Um, the rest of the time, it's either going to be um, as a pupa or there's going to be the time of the egg. And as you can see on the left, monarchs have this same thing going on. So... About three to five days, it's an egg. About nine to 14 days, they're growing up as a caterpillar, the larva. As a chrysalis, the pupa, eight to 13 days, and then they become the adult. Now, in general, that's about one month for a life cycle for a monarch. Now, we see monarchs throughout the year, it's because they are multi-generational. They have many generations. So, for example, when they first come from Mexico in the spring, which will be April, May, around here, they uh, first hit southern uh, Texas. The adults breed. They lay their eggs. Those adults eventually die away. Those caterpillars grow up, produce the next generation. That next generation moves a little farther north. The generation after that moves a little farther north. So you may have four to five generations, and that last generation that you'll see late in the summer or if you're even all the way up in Canada, that generation you see there, they are the ones who head all the way south. Now, you're wondering, well, if they only live, you know, in total about a month, how can they do this? That last generation is special uh, due to changes in their physiology, their internal uh, workings. They actually live much longer. They may live upwards of sometimes close to nine months. They store up a lot of energy, head down south to Mexico, and in Mexico, they're basically going through kind of a winter sleep sort of sense. Um, they spend most of their time just sitting around in the trees. They're a little bit in cold storage. Uh, they aren't feeding uh, much. They aren't uh, drinking water much. They're not really doing anything. They're just waiting for that spring. It's that one peculiar generation. That's the only generation that lives for a good long time. And they're the ones who come the next year into the southern U.S. Now, unfortunately, the problem that's been going on with monarchs is that they are in decline. This is the migratory eastern population that you see here. And the way that we estimate how many monarchs there are is we actually look at the overwintering site. We look at the fir forest in the mountains of Mexico and how many hectares, which is about two and a half acres per hectare, how much land do they cover and then we estimate about 50 million uh, monarch butterflies per hectare. That's how we get a general number as to how many uh, monarchs there may be. But this is just showing straight by hectares. And you can see that back around 96, 97, 
they were over 18 hectares of land covered with monarchs. And at that time, the population was close to about a billion uh, butterflies. If you look at the downward trend uh, since then, and last, and actually this past, uh, this winter, down to two hectares. So we have lost upwards of 90% of the entire Eastern monarch population. I hate to say this is a little bit of good news because the Western monarch population uh, has fared even worse. Uh, right now, they're down to less than 2,000, total 2,000 Western monarch butterflies uh, that have been counted this year. And there's a very good chance that by you know, later this year, um, as we get into the winter, there may be almost no Western monarchs at all. So that is going to be a major catastrophe that that population may go extinct. Uh, there is a, a chance it could recover, but right now it doesn't look very good. But the Eastern population has also declined. And there are a number of reasons why this population has declined, both the East and the West. So there is one of the biggest things that we can address and we'll talk about today is loss of the milkweed plants in agriculture and other landscapes, and also not just milkweed, but the nectar plants too, that the adults need to feed on. When I was growing up as a kid, you drive around in the country, you'd see all of these milkweed plants along the roadside. Now you rarely see any milkweeds whatsoever. You know, we've tended to cut all those down. Um, the use of certain types of pesticides and herbicides in particular, milkweeds have been much more susceptible than some in the past. Uh, weather is, gonna, is a major factor now, unfortunately, with climate change. With some of the loss of some of the fur forests being cut down, that changes that environment for them to kind of overwinter. Uh, it tends to be get, gets even colder and wetter, uh, which can be harmful to the butterflies. But also as we see storms appearing even earlier, that can affect those butterflies. Drought in the southern U.S. when the monarchs are coming in, which may be affecting both the nectar, populate, nectar plants and the milkweed, that has an effect. And work by Chip Taylor from Monarch Watch uh, has found that even just a change in two degrees Fahrenheit from the average during May when they normally show up around this area can have a major impact because there could be a disassociation, a missing link between when the plants are around and when the monarchs are around. So if they arrive before the plants are available, there's nothing for them to lay their eggs on. If they arrive too late, those plants actually may be a little older because they actually prefer some of those younger plants. That loss of habitat is a big one. And as I mentioned earlier, that a good portion of the breeding monarch population is in that central U.S., what we now kind of euphemistically call the corn and soybean belt, but we've lost a lot of grassland to conversion to agriculture. And even in agriculture where you used to have uh, either hedgerows or uh, wildlife habitat strips around that, that oftentimes planting from fence row to fence row has gotten rid of that habitat. So there's been a major loss in overall habitat, which is for the milkweed, which then uh, supports those monarchs. Pesticides are a major uh, hit on them and work by uh, John Pleasance at Iowa State and Karen Oberhauser, uh, formerly from uh, University of Minnesota, estimates that there's been, this was in 2012, a 58% decline in milkweed density from 1990 to 2010. There's been loss even more. And what's been most problematic is we've been using pesticides for a good long time, but glyphosate which is an active ingredient in uh, products like Roundup, milkweed seems to be much more susceptible than they have, uh, have been for other types of herbicides. So a large use of uh, glyphosate has really also drastically cut back on milkweed. And here you can see uh, kind of a, an issue. So you can see where a lot of glyphosate is being used <clears throat> in that corn and soybean belt. And in relationship to where we have most of the breeding monarch population. So um, it is, it's a good correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean causation, but with the increased use of glyphosate, 
Um, we have lost a lot of milkweed and other nectar plants. And as I said, this is the major breeding area for uh, monarchs. But the nice thing is, you know, we can improve things. This is another uh, way of showing uh, an idea of the loss <clears throat> over the years. So this is 2010 to 2013. This is just looking at um, overnight roosting sites. So as monarchs are moving toward Mexico, they'll often nest or nest roost in large aggregations in a tree or several trees. So you may go out one morning and see several thousand monarchs in a tree in your backyard. They're just waiting for the next day to move on. But you can see how the number of those over uh, night roosting sites have also declined over that time period too. But as I said, this is, you know, often with a lot of conservation stories, it's kind of gloom and doom and depressing. But the beauty of monarchs is it's also a conservation story that everybody can participate in. <clears throat> it's one that goes across generations, across um, uh, any business, you know, so from whether you're a home gardener to a farmer, everyone can participate, whether you're in a department of transportation, everyone can participate in monarch conservation. So in order to do monarch conservation and to support monarchs, you need two things. You need host plants. <clears throat> host plants are what the caterpillars feed on. So different species of butterflies, they have different host plants. Uh, for monarchs, as I mentioned, it's only milkweed. But there are a lot of different varieties of milkweed, but it's the only thing that the monarch caterpillars can eat. They can't eat anything else. So if you do not have milkweed, you will not be producing monarchs. Nectar plants are also incredibly important. So the adult butterflies can't feed on the leaves of the milkweed. They need nectar. So having those nectar resources in the spring, summer, and fall. So spring when they're moving in, summer when they're around, and fall when they're moving south to Mexico to fuel those adults are incredibly important too. So oftentimes when I've talked to people about you know, helping monarchs, they keep talking about milkweed, and that's really important. And milkweed does produce a lot of good nectar too for them, for the, the adults, but it's all those other plant species that we need to be looking at too. So I'm just going to go through a few different species of milkweed which are readily available and kind of show you that they <clears throat> are fairly common. Uh, they're a little bit different in structure. Uh, common milkweed is a little bit different than some of the other milkweeds because it tends to be what's called a pioneer species. It likes disturbed habitat. This is the one that you'd often see, particularly in farms, because what is a farm but disturbed habitat as it's tilled or set aside for planting for whatever crop, it is a not a natural habitat. So this is actually a perfect place for common milkweed. This is one of the largest milkweeds we have, really big, round, uh, runs oval leaves to it. Um, it also can spread very readily too. This is one thing that people often don't like about common milkweed. It spreads often through what are called stolons. So uh, like a shooting branch coming off by the roots and producing more and more. Uh, for example, here at our house, we actually had them popping up in our lawn because they spread out from our garden. But I look at it, you know, if you see them and you don't want them in that particular place, you kind of cut them down. Swamp, marsh, or red milkweed is probably the second most common. And common milkweed and marsh milkweed are also the two most preferred plants for females to lay their eggs on. So this is also work done at uh, Iowa State. They looked at a whole variety of different uh, milkweed plants and monarchs will use all different varieties. But the two that they really prefer are swamp and common. Swamp is a little bit smaller, only about four feet tall, has this beautiful pink, reddish magenta flowers. The nice part about it, it also tolerates wet feet. So if you have a little bit of wetter area, whether it's your home or on the farm, this will tolerate that much better than common or other milkweeds. Butterfly weed is the one that a lot of people really seem to like. You'll still see this along with the common and marsh along roadsides, um, usually orange flowers, but there are some varieties where they are yellow too. They tend to be smaller in stature, only maybe two to three feet tall. I find them sometimes problematic in growing them in the garden uh, because if you have a lot of other plants which may be a little more aggressive and taller, they may outcompete the 
uh, butterfly weed compared to the marsh and common. I've seen marsh and common. We actually did some experiments at the St. Louis Zoo, uh, different plantings. And we had this one site that suddenly became heavily infested with common ragweed. And it was interesting how the common milkweed and the marsh milkweed dealt with the ragweed. The common milkweed tended to just grow around the ragweed and avoided it and still came up. The marsh milkweed just kind of plowed right through the ragweed. So even though it was a dense cover of ragweed, the marsh milkweed didn't care. They just came up through it. But it outcompeted things like butterfly weed. World milkweed is one that really likes kind of drier conditions. It looks very different than the others. It has very fine leaves, almost like a when you think of pines, uh, pine needles. Um, we have it planted at our house here in Missouri in what we're calling sort of a glade garden. So amongst rocks, uh, it's a much drier habitat, very rocky, and it is blooming to beat the band. So it has gotten up to three feet tall and upwards of two and a half to three feet wide. It almost becomes like a, a bush, but is really uh, good at uh, being drought tolerant too. And then showy, which is just a really big, attractive one, can often be confused with the common milkweed, but the flowers are, are a little bit different as longer uh, petals on it. But you can choose a variety of different types of milkweed. As long as you're uh, planting milkweed, you know, this is going to be beneficial for the monarchs. Prairies or Sullivan's milkweed. This one uh, is not as common, but you can see it is also, I'm pointing out also those milkweeds, which are very common in this, this area too, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. So these are all good selections. And all of these are usually readily available from uh, either by seed or from nurseries or other suppliers. Now, when you're thinking about designing a habitat for monarchs, and when we're talking about designing habitat for monarchs, we're really talking about designing for a lot of different species. Monarchs are really that hinge. Think of monarchs as sort of a flagship species. So if you're planting for monarchs, you're going to get other things coming too. You're going to get bees. You're going to get birds. You're going to get a whole variety of different beneficial insects too. So by planting a habitat for monarchs, you're actually improving it for a lot of different wildlife. Because remember, everything is really interrelated and interconnected. So in designing these habitats, you really want to do clumps in general of flowers. Think of a flower as a billboard or a signpost. If you're driving along the highway, you see one sign. It may have caught your eye. You may have seen what it was about. But if you have a number of signs in a row, then, okay, now you know what they're talking about. Same thing with flowers. Flowers are those billboards, the signs to attract butterflies, bees, other beneficial insects to your garden. Also, if you can't necessarily do like a clump, if you've got a large space, disperse them throughout so you actually increase the general foraging. So when a butterfly or bee goes from flower to flower, sometimes it may not be in one section, it's throughout the area. For overall pollinator diversity and for monarchs, you know, we're just talking about one species, but to really increase the diversity in your gardens um, or other planted areas, you really want 15 to 25 flower species, and you want them blooming, blooming spring, summer, and fall. As I mentioned with the monarchs, they're arriving in spring. They may be hanging around during the summer in your area, um, and then in the fall, they're moving south. So you really need to make sure you've got plants blooming those three different time periods in order to support those monarchs. This is an example of one of those fall plants. Because oftentimes I see people that look at summer as a time to garden, and particularly when kids are off from school, you play in the garden more. And you may not necessarily think about those fall plants. So things like blazing star, this plant, also called gay feather, um, goldenrods. Um, some people don't like goldenrods um, for usually one of two reasons. One, they can be aggressive, but that's really on a few species like Canada goldenrod. Uh, but some people think they also cause hay fever. And unfortunately, it's bad PR because goldenrods bloom around the same time as ragweed and common ragweed, which cause hay fever. Goldenrod does not cause hay fever. But when you also have allergy companies trying to advertise or put a picture on their box, what do they often show? They show flowers. It's very hard to show these nondescript little green flowers of ragweed, uh, which is actually causing the hay fever. 
So unfortunately, goldenrod, just because it blooms at the time of ragweed, tends to get a bad rap, but it is a great nectar source for monarch butterflies heading south um, and other uh, animals like bumblebee queen storing up energy for them to overwinter too. And then asters are also a great one for fall. Now, when we're, also, when we're looking at our gardens, we're often looking at the choices between exotic plants and native plants. And there can be some benefits to exotics. One is that they're often readily available. You can usually find them all over the place. Um, they have a, they're often very prolific because we've bred them to be prolific. But there are some downsides. Uh, one is that they're really not improving native biodiversity because these are these non-native plants are not host plants for our native species. So even if, um, for example, uh, willow, we'll take a simple example of willow. So willow is a host plant for a variety of butterflies, one of my favorite red spotted purple, but there are some non-native willows like curly leaf willow that it will doesn't really like to eat at all. It's the native willows which they've adapted to. And also some of these exotic plants can become invasive too. So we have, and that can outcompete other native plants in other areas. Native plants, their benefits, they enhance biodiversity. Uh, you can use them to recreate imperiled habitats too and improve them. Grassland, prairie habitats are one of the most endangered habitats in the world. And by putting in more of these native plants, we're actually helping to improve that overall health of really North America and all those plants. They're usually less likely to be invasive they're adapted really to our local climate. And then with climate change too, a lot of these plants are, you know, really adapted to whether it be, you know, droughts or monsoon, which can happen throughout the Midwest. They can tolerate that. Disadvantages, oftentimes they may cost a little more uh, initially. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for them to establish, or it may be just more difficult to find them. But there are more and more suppliers for these plants uh, nowadays uh, here in Missouri, we've got a lot of good suppliers and online resources that can help you find them. Um, but I'll give you a couple at the end where you can actually help to find some of the milkweeds that you can use for your uh, plantings. So I want to talk a few more issues about the benefits of native plants and then get into some um, kind of grander schemes for habitat restoration. And that, the grander schemes really means anything from a nice patch in your uh, garden to larger areas on farmland or uh, right-of-ways, utility right-of-ways, or if you just as a community or an individual have a large piece of property to start developing. I'll talk about that in a moment. So other benefits of native plants, they're it's a sustainable vegetation environment. As I said, these are, most of them are either perennials living from year to year, or they readily reseed themselves like the Coreopsis. So they'll come back year after year. Um, by having a variety of natives, you create that really diverse ground cover. Improved erosion control. Our native plants have these really long, deep roots. And by putting those roots down, it does two, th well, actually three things. One, it really stabilizes those soils. So it reduces erosion. By those roots going very deeply, it opens up air spaces. And plants, roots actually require air. We don't tend to think about that. So that those air spaces um, for respiration for the plant roots is important. But those air spaces also allow for water infiltration. So if you get heavy rains, you get that water going into the soil so you don't get that runoff, so you don't get that soil erosion, um, you don't get that flooding. So they're really important in that respect. They work in various diverse ecosystems. So you can find plants that work in a variety of places from woodland to grassland and once they're started, they're really pretty low maintenance. Uh, you don't, I mean, you kind of let them be and do their own thing. Um, and that's the beauty of native plants. Now, there are some obstacles. Um, a lot of landowners think of native plants as weeds. And I think part of that is often how we start them off. So you, you often scatter a bunch of wildflower seeds and that first year that doesn't look well, if you notice the one thing I point out, until established, plant areas are usually not visually appealing. It looks like a weed patch. So there's this kind of general phrase uh, when we talk about restoration. So first year it sleeps, second year it creeps, 
and then the third year it leaps. So that third year, you really get that full bloom going on. But there are ways of working with this too. So for example, when I do it, uh, put together seed mix or recommend to people, that first year it sleeps often is that time when you're looking at, oh, nothing's happening. I don't really see anything going on. Putting in those early annual natives like Coreopsis, which can produce that really wonderful yellow bloom um, and take off that first year while those other plants are coming in it is a really good way to make sure that you're selling your project to somebody. Um, farmers are often concerned with plants spreading to crop areas. As I said, with the common milkweed, that's very common. And sometimes people just don't understand all those benefits of those native plants, particularly if you're looking at, you know, um, from a farmer's point of view, I'm looking at my particular crops. You're not necessarily looking at the benefits. Now we can do a whole other talks on beneficial insects and these native plants supporting beneficial insects to deal with pests, to reduce pesticide use, et cetera. But it's really getting that understanding of those benefits. Now, when we look at setting up habitat, we kind of have two mindsets we need to be dealing with that are oftentimes at odds. So as I said, this goes with just working in your garden to larger scale you know, habitat restoration. There's an idealism that, well, if I just stop mowing and plants come up, it's gonna look wonderful. Well, think about if you live in a city and you stop mowing, well, we've already planted a lot of exotic grasses like fescues, uh, zoysia, uh, bluegrass, etc. Well, if you stop mowing, it's really just increasing those. You might have some Dutch sweet white clover, but just stopping mowing, you don't necessarily get the native plants because they've been gone for a while. So there is a realism also, too, with mowing that when you don't mow, um, people then get that idea, well, this is a weedy patch, it's unkept, it's, you know, collects debris. I know for, uh, here, the Missouri Department of Transportation, areas where they don't mow, the previous head of revegetation, she would get complaints that um, it was a safety hazard because snakes would hide out there. Now, why snakes would hide out there compared to anything else and why the, the snakes we have around here are not dangerous, but people were concerned about that. But there's a way to do that. So if you're planting a habitat, if you just have a mowed edge to it, you already designate that as being a plant garden. So it becomes actually more acceptable. And there's a lot of uh, studies showing that by doing something as simple as putting a little fence around and having a mowed edge to it, uh, delineating where that natural vegetation is, it does give that impression that or that idea that, oh, this was planned, it isn't just a, a weed patch. So when you're putting in the seeds, you know, the idea, well, I'm just gonna scatter and sow the seeds and that's gonna come up. Well, if you have a lot of other, you know, vegetation. So if I just threw a bunch of native seeds onto, for example, our lawn here, I'm not gonna get much coming up because that lawn is already thick and it's already uh, competing with any space that any of our native wildflowers or even native grasses would deal with. So the realism, you need to prepare the site. Um, and that's gonna be time and manpower commitments. It could be a variety of things. I'll talk about a variety of ways of site preparation. And the one thing that really people look at is what is the cost? Um, this is just two simple examples for larger per acre restoration projects that we've done at the St. Louis Zoo in different areas. Um, Site preparation, that can really vary depending upon uh, the area, the total acreage. So sometimes site preparation means using some chemicals to get rid of the existing plants. There are other ways of using plastic to solarize it, which is much cheaper, uh, more time consuming, um, or the site preparation may be you know, repeated uh, short crop mowing for several years and then maybe tilling it up a little bit. Seed price can also vary uh, depending upon how diverse a seed mix you, you have, uh, if you're going for just, you know, 10 seed, 10 varieties, or what I usually recommend, you know, 30 or more variety, different species. That way, some plants just may not take, some will. So by having more diversity in that seed mix, you're going to get a better, um, a better uh, garden coming up or better habitat restoration because there are more chances. 
just like if you're buying a lottery ticket, if you just buy one lottery ticket, if you buy 100 lottery tickets, just like if you're planting one seed versus 100 seeds, there's a better chance you can win. Now, with planting wildflower seeds, you have a much better chance of winning than you do with the lottery, I should point out. Oftentimes, we tend to go that idealism again, oh, well, I'm just going to start anywhere. Um, but really, you need to look at the site selection. Um, and this is really uh, important for either you at home or a, a DOT or a farmer or a large landholder or whatever. If you start someplace where you may not have great success, you may be you know, actually deterred and say, well, this didn't work. I, I'm not going to do anything. Um, also, like with the seed mixes, even around your house or your farm, you have a little bit different uh, soil qualities. You have a little bit different uh, moisture qualities. So some plants will take and some won't. So trying it in certain areas and also particularly with a house, you have different areas of sunlight. So you want to try it in an area where you can have the best success at first, and then you can kind of spread out. So it's really looking at those areas where you can have success. So for our house here, we live in a corner lot, and one of our uh, big pollinator habitats is on the corner. So it gets full sun. Um, it's delineated by a sidewalk, so it looks you know, like it's a managed, presentable area. But we also then experiment with a lot of the plants we have there in different other parts of our garden around the house. And we find that some will do well in a slightly shadier area, some not, some a little bit wetter. But we can then start experimenting. But having that first success where you feel good, it's, you're doing something, then you start expanding and trying different things. From a broader perspective, this is where idealism and realism often kind of clash. So we want to look at this, and this whole talk is really about, this is all for the common goods, for the monarch and all the other wildlife associated with monarch butterflies. So we all want to be in this together. But when you're looking at a homeowners association, a community association, uh, city rules, county rules, um, if you are a, um, a particular agency of the government, everyone has different goals. And you need to make sure that everything is in alignment. Uh, sometimes it may mean kind of changing direction for uh, that group. So, for example, common milkweed in some areas is, even though it's a native species, it's very important for wildlife and particularly monarchs. Some people may list it as a noxious weed and you're not to plant it. So here, for example, in St. Louis, uh, common milkweed is listed as a noxious weed that one agency within the St. Louis government says you shouldn't plant it, and yet the city of St. Louis is telling everybody to plant common milkweed and other milkweeds. So they've kind of, they're going against their own rules for the benefit of the common good, and hopefully eventually they'll just eliminate that uh, one sentence in some of the regulations that you shouldn't be planting uh, common milkweed. But it's really kind of weird too, because the city has a, one agency is working in two different directions. So um, sometimes this is one thing you have to kind of look at and deal with. So when you're also doing these plantings and whether it's at home and working with your neighbors um, or actually neighbors in general, um, but and also trying to get other people involved, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to blame anybody for the issue. You know, it's because of you that we don't have monarchs you really need that positive attitude. Well, this is what we can do to help monarchs. That everybody can be involved. And that's the one thing with monarch butterflies. More and more research is showing that in order to conserve the monarch, it can't be the home gardener, it can't be public lands, it can't be departments of transportation, it can't be just farmers. Everyone has to come together in order to support monarchs. It's kind of an all hands on deck, but it's really community wide that we need to all work together the other education is perception of weeds and unfortunately milkweed has a lousy name it says weed um hard to kind of get around that um they all have weed in their name unfortunately um maybe using some of the uh indigenous names for them um, or just talking about them as a sclepius some way that you throw in that word and people say oh you're planting weeds um, type of agricultural areas, 
on in farmland there's usually one area or maybe a few areas that it's just real difficult to grow some crops um, or you're wasting a bunch of money trying to get any sort of yield those would be perfect areas for planting you also need to start thinking about corridors the monarch migration is requires a corridor from mexico all the way to canada so we need all of these stepping stones all of these plantings all along um, of milkweed and nectar plants to create those corridors and developing those green spaces and then the the final thing is seed availability do you just go for you know common milkweed or the common milkweed which is particularly grown in your area and this is sometimes depends upon actually what is available so for many plants we are able to find those ecotypes and sometimes how people define it as a plant within 25 100 150 miles of that location but there are some species that we can only get a general type so it's looking at those things to consider when you're planting also do you already have habitats existing um, saving that habitat or augmenting it um, can you work with other existing restoration projects to expand that burning is a major uh, aspect to think about particularly in a prairie type habitat fire is natural in these situations but in some areas you cannot burn either through local ordinance or if it's along roadsides causing smoke in the fields or if it's under utility right-of-way you can't burn because that could cause arcing from the power lines so can you use burning uh, then you have to think about other methods such as mowing or possibly even grazing and then what is the long-term maintenance management so we have to understand that this is a commitment it's just like raising kids you know you have a baby you don't go okay i'm done now you've got that long-term commitment to you know take care of those that child uh raise them upright uh get them a good education in some respects habitat is the same way you know you just can't plant it and walk away because they're going to be these invasives who want to disrupt things so making sure you keep them at bay maybe reinforcing them with some more seeds or plants um, but it is a commitment to maintain habitat um, whatever those other issues might be so if you are thinking of a larger uh, acreage to do some uh, issues there are some different guidelines for monarchs this also comes out of uh, Iowa State so first off look at species native to your state you don't want to be planting tropical milkweed in the wild in anywhere around in the Midwest because that is a southern US and tropical species what species are grown in your state so what can you actually get um, you don't want to have a lot of competition um, particularly like if you're using grasses like big blue stem Indian grass switchgrass which can also spread very readily do they start overshadowing some of those uh, forbs those wildflowers that you're uh, wanting to plant in your seed mix 70 to 75 percent forbs you know looking at what the moisture content is if it's very wet if it's very dry looking at the, the flowering time remember as i said you want spring summer and fall so april through october you want at least 35 species it's best to have at least two different milkweed species because those will also bloom at different times they'll mature at different rates and the butterflies may prefer them at different times um, and you don't want to overuse any one particular type of wildflower wildflower or form so really it should be more than 10 percent of that mix and then when you're looking at a good restoration look at cool and warm season grasses sedges legumes and forbs for a really complete restoration so we're looking at site preparation um, we're finishing up here a couple things to look at herbicides are very common but there's uh, an issue with possibly uh, a lot of spraying of uh, things like glyphosate tarping or solarization is one method um, where you put out plastic and basically you're basically you're cooking the plants in the seed bed in order to kill those off to allow for the new plants to come in there's also tilling you have to be very conscious of that because that can also uh, bring up some of the the weeds seeds but a mix of for example no herbicide using mowing and tilling for a couple of years can really get rid of that weed bed um, and other things too depending on what the land was originally uh, some of the easiest restorations are for example uh, old soybean fields 
because it's already been managed for that bare ground and in order to allow for those plantings. When you plant two, um, you really want to plant in mid-November to end of March because a lot of, if you're planting seeds, they need to stratify, they need to go through a cold period. Um, you, it also improves the establishment of wildflowers. Um, those native seeds, you don't want to plant very deeply, you know, only zero to a quarter inch. Uh, if you're doing plugs, there are some recommendations, and I'll mention Monarch Watch again in a, a second. They have recommendations if you're planting plugs, three to four plants per patch, 10 to 13 patches per acre. And then, as I said, management. This is long-term care, so you may have to, to deal with if a large restoration needs uh, weeds that are in there, mowing three to five times to keep those uh, plants down. Um, second year, probably only mowing once. Third or fourth, you know, burns or using that, um, some sort of grazing or mowing strategy, but only doing about a third of that area at a time. Now, there are a bunch of really good resources out there, depending upon who you are and what you want to do. So Farmers for Monarchs is a group that we also helped to establish. Um, it kind of spun off from the Keystone Monarch Collaborative. And Farmers for Monarchs gives a lot of good information, uh, best management practices, uh, different plants. And actually, uh, some of the links go directly to Missourians for Monarchs, where we've put together a number of best management practices for whether it be grazing land or uh, row crops, et cetera. Um, Farmers for Monarchs also lists from a farmer's perspective what um, economic tools can be used. What are the uh, possible sources of funds for creating and maintaining monarch habitat? For anyone, Monarch Joint Venture and Monarch Watch, both of those have a lot of excellent resources on everything from habitat restoration to plant selection to uh, getting involved with citizen science on identifying monarchs. And Monarch Watch also, um, you can get local ecotype uh, milkweed from them. They also do donations. So if you are a school or a community project doing some restoration or a larger restoration project, we were able to get around 1,600 milkweed plants donated to us for some restoration projects. Um, the Winnebago Reservation and then the campuses of Nebraska and Community College, uh, both on the Omaha and Santee, so that that was a uh, free donation of, uh, as I said, almost 2,000 uh, milkweed plants. Xerxes Society has a number of good resources. If you want to get, to get into milkweeds and raising them to supply other people or understanding what milkweeds are around, there are other organizations, if you want to contact me later, that are also looking for people to get involved with collecting seed pods, um, and they're paying per pound uh, for milkweeds that they're actually using to disseminate or for other products. But Xerxes Society has a lot of good resources for pollinators in general and a lot of uh, stuff on monarchs. And then also through Xerxes, there's the milkweed seed finder. So if you are looking for seeds, um, you can log in and find out who are the seed providers in your area for milkweed. So there's a lot of things to consider with monarchs and monarch conservation. Um, but this is overall conservation. But as I said, the beautiful thing about monarchs and pollinators in general is it's conservation for everybody. And what I tell people, particularly come from, uh, come from the St. Louis Zoo, if you want to help tigers, you want to help elephants, you want to help gorillas, what do you do? You come to the zoo, you support the zoo, you support other conservation organizations that do that, do that work, and then you're pretty much done. But with pollinators, you can do exactly those same things, but you can plant a garden. Um, you can also eat healthier, too. By eating more fruits and vegetables, those plants which depend upon pollinators means that farmers need to grow them, which needs they need to make sure that they have pollinators. So it's a win-win for everybody. But you can get directly involved in the simplest thing is planting a garden so everybody can be a pollinator conservationist. And the one thing, and we'll put it in the chat as I uh, finish up, I forgot to put on this slide my email address. So if anybody wants to contact me later about any questions, um, they can very readily uh, email me at uh, spevak, S-P-E-V-A-K dot org, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And actually, I'll just type that into the chat right here. 
And with that, I thank you very much. Awesome. We do have a few questions in the chat here, Ed. Yep. Um, so, and I'll go ahead and uh, pop your email over. Um, and then for folks that were kind of following along in the chat box as well, I was popping links to um, some things that Ed was referring to. I know he referred to the Monarch Seed Mix through Iowa State, so I popped the link in there for that. Um, as well as the other links uh, for farmers, for Monarchs, Monarch Watch, the joint venture, all that stuff's in the chat as well. All right, so let me jump up to our first question here. Give folks some time to write that down. All right, so the first question that I see here was, uh, do you know what happened between 2018 to 2019 that caused the Monarch population to spike up? So um, actually, it was just really good weather. <laughs> so everything was just actually beautiful those years. Um, we didn't have you know major areas of drought um, or uh, flooding, and it was really two things. So that you know, the major benefits within the growing season that were really beneficial, and then also the uh, overwintering site uh, logging seemed to be reduced for a little bit, and we didn't have any major storms. So it was kind of a, everything just kind of working together, which allowed the modern population. But that's a good example to show that if we can put all these plantings in place, you know, we can bring that monarch population back relatively quickly because we need to get to about uh, estimates of about six hectares overwintering for a sustainable population. As I said, right now we're at, you know, 2.1. So we want to bring that back. So everybody just start planting milkweed and nectar plants. And then the other one was, what kind of aster would you recommend? Oh, there's a lot of good uh, uh, asters. Uh, sky blue, aromatic, New England. New England tends to get a bad rap uh, because it can get really big and kind of flop around. Um, but there's, um, as I said, yeah, the aromatic and you know things like the sky blue are very um, easily maintained. But even New England aster, if you cut them earlier in the season, they don't get as big and start spreading as much. So you can even control your New England aster, but there are a lot of good asters to choose from. Just see what's available uh, from either your nursery or suppliers online too. And then the next question we have here was that native plants tend to be unruly. How do we deal with that? So the unruliness uh, can be one of two things. Either they start spreading up from that area um, or uh, sometimes flopping. That can be an unruly aspect. Cup plant, uh, genus Silphium, is a really good one for that unruliness because it will get to eight to ten feet tall, and if there's nothing to support it, comes you know comes down. So there are a couple ways of dealing with the unruliness. One is if you've got a nice discrete patch, um, to you can put either a fence around it. One is also just having a variety of different plants with that to create structure, to support those plants, which, you know, would tend to fall over. In a prairie, you have a whole diversity of, uh, I've got a kitty bothering me. There's a, a whole variety of other plants supporting each other. So that is one aspect of it. The other aspect of unruliness sometimes you'll see in the, um, after the season ends, so some people have this idea that, oh, I need to clean this up right away. So what you really want to do, you want to let those plants stay for the winter because a lot of those seed heads are going to be used by uh, birds like goldfinches, et cetera. And then in the spring, if you really need to clean up, um, cut the stems only to about 18 to 24 inches. So it helps to clean up the area, but those stems can be used by different native bees for nesting in. They'll eventually disappear after a couple of years. The other plants will grow around that. So there are a couple ways of um, really kind of dealing with that sort of unruliness. Awesome. And before we jump to this question, I do just want to remind folks that we have the evaluation link um, in the chat as well. I've been adding a lot of uh, different links in there, but it should be the last one uh, from the Sealing Garden Show pages. But the next question we have here is how often should I reseed my wildflower patch? So that depends upon what's coming up. So. If you put out seeds and um, particularly if you put them out during the, the winter where, oh, come here, you little brat. Sorry. 
Um, so if you put them out and have had time to stratify, see what comes up during that year. Oftentimes, some plants um, may need a, a couple winters to kind of break their dormancy. So first off, wait a couple years. Then look at what plants that you seeded aren't coming up. And then you can kind of add additional seeds to it. So for I would wait, um, you know, probably a good year to two. Uh, and if there are certain plants that uh, you just didn't see coming up, you can also put in some additional plugs. But really kind of be selective on what you're adding to it. Time and time is, is one that we often, we want something to happen right away. So that's why, you know, as I said, like adding a Coreopsis gives that immediate color while everything else is, it takes time to come in. Next question we have here is, can prairie plants be transplanted? Uh, many of them can. Some uh, common milkweed doesn't like being transplanted. Others like bee balm uh, readily transplants, uh, genus Monarda. Uh, it's a great one to share with people. So you can cut and you know take half of them, give them to someone else. Uh, some like fleabane, uh, genus Rigeron. I've dug them up, stuck them in a pot, forgot them about them for a few days, and then planted them later with no problem. So it really depends upon the plant. Many of them can be, the, but the as I said, common milkweed is one that, which really doesn't tolerate uh, transplanting at all. And this one is, what is your opinion on individuals bringing in monarch caterpillars to care for through the metamorphosis in captivity? So there are a couple issues with that. If you are doing just a couple for yourself as a way to kind of see that beauty and uh, mystery of metamorphosis, uh, working with children, that's not a problem. If you're looking at doing that as a way to help the monarch population, it really doesn't do that because if you look at say several you know million monarchs and you're raising five or six it really doesn't add much to the population but what's more intriguing is a research is just discovering too that how people rear them uh, can have two effects one is if you have a number of monarch caterpillars you're raising them in close confinement there are some diseases that could be spread to the wild population so you have to be really strict in your cleaning protocols. The other is just by having those monarchs not exposed to natural light, even in the chrysalis stage, can actually disrupt their migration. So those monarchs um, aren't really migrating you know, south. They may be just going somewhere else. If you're doing it from an education point of view, to understand it, to teach kids, whether in a classroom or yourself, that's not an issue but it is not really a conservation effort um, um, or really uh, can kind of screw up their own individual uh, migration. Modern Joint Venture does have some guidelines if you are planning on rearing any uh, for yourself, they have some hand rearing guidelines to go by. Awesome, well, um, we'll wait here for just a second, see if any other questions come in. Uh, but while we wait, I just want to remind folks where they can uh, find some more information on the other sessions. So if you visit our Siouxland Garden Show website, go over to the speakers tab. You can click on, on any of these sessions. You can watch the archived ones. Um, Renee's session was the only one that wasn't archived, um, but there are going to be a few other sessions coming up with Preserve the Taste of Summer. So feel free to reach out to me if you want some information on that. Um, for Ed's session today, feel free to fill out the evaluation link. So if you just go under his tab, you can find the evaluation link. And then I also do want to just give a little shout out to the plant sale going on with the Les Hills Wild Ones. It's happening until March 31st. Uh, so a lot of the milkweeds and the asters that were mentioned today, you can actually find on that um, Wild Ones plant sale. Of course, a lot of other garden vendors as well, um, you can reach out to for that. It looks like we just had a couple other ones coming in. So where can we order monarch chrysalises or eggs? So that, that's also a, a problem too. There are, there, there are two issues. One is U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, if you are breeding for particular release, you should actually not be bringing in any butterfly caterpillars from another state because even though monarchs are found throughout the Eastern U.S., they can be locally adapted to, you know, 
a monarch from Iowa is different than a monarch from uh, Maine. So their life cycle, even though they're all going to in general is the same, they can have different um, alleles, different genetic variants that adapt them to those particular places. Additionally, oftentimes, you know, like if you're in, say, in Iowa or Nebraska, you're buying something from the East Coast. It is, as I said, it's not an individual that was born and bred here. The, the most, the best thing to really do <clears throat> is really if you got some monitor, if you got some milkweed out, look at them periodically, um, check for eggs, um, check for caterpillars. If you want to bring a few of those in. I, I personally don't recommend buying a bunch of you know caterpillars or eggs from another supplier because that can really kind of screw things up. I'm sorry to say. Awesome. It looks like we um, don't have any other questions. So just a reminder for folks to go ahead and join us later on today at 3 p.m. Central Time for uh, Wildlife and the Landscape. Um, and then also our other two sessions next week. And Ed, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see everyone later today. Thank you very much. I'm off to another meeting.